Hello and welcome back to the Resilient Kid podcast with me, Ashley Costello, psychotherapist of over 25 years, TEDx speaker and author. And I am joined by a guest today, the lovely Catherine Sandland. Hello, how are you? <gasps> Hello, I'm fine, thank you. This is very exciting and thank you so much for inviting me on your podcast. Well, it's a little bit more, I should be thanking you for coming on because today everyone is a little bit different. So we've invited Catherine on, we'll talk a little bit more about what Catherine does in a second and get her to introduce herself. But I've invited Catherine on to talk about my book and you'll probably think, oh, that's a bit egotistical, but actually it's about Catherine as, you know, two children various ages and actually um with her background uh, there was nobody better to kind of pull out some of the stuff of the book and interview me so <laughs> she's really going to be the host of today um so Catherine tell us a little bit about what you do and uh yeah tell us that first and then we'll we'll say how we know each other and things after that Okay, well, um, I am a speaker, coach and presentation skills trainer and I have been for, well, my business I've had for 24 years, but I've been specifically a presentation skills coach for the last 14. Um, and um, it's, I, I just love helping people to step up and into the spotlight um, to be able to take something that means a lot to them and that for them to be able to express that in a way that that, that lands well with people, that influences, that has an impact, and for them to feel and look and sound super confident when they do when they do that. Um, so sometimes that's presentations, as you would perhaps, or your listeners will perhaps imagine it to be on a stage and you know with the lights and all the rest of it. Sometimes though, it's just people talking about their business, or indeed people talking about their books. Mm. See what I did there. <laughs> You can see now, can't you, listen, that's why we've got it right. Um, yes, so um, Catherine and I met, oh, Ooh. a good while ago, I would say, probably about six or seven years ago, mm -hmm. and it was 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. morning, it was winter, it was dark, I think it was November, mm -hmm. um, and I pulled a tea towel out of the back of her pants bizarrely yes. do you want to explain a little bit more about that Catherine or shall I shall oh, well, we just I, I sort of either want to gloss over it or or perhaps shock your readers I don't know it was an outdoor um, exercise class wasn't it and there was this sort of game where we uh, one of the partners had a, this tea towel in the back of pocket I think the idea was that the other partner had to to get it out but that involved a lot of jumping and running and 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 and, and running around which was good because it was 6am and it was dark and it was on a November morning um to get the heart rate going but yeah it was a bit of a weird way to um to get to know somebody in fact I don't know if if somebody had said to us at the time you know what you're going to really like this person and get to know them quite well and indeed work with them um, I'm not sure that I would have believed them at that point but hey ho it's a good story isn't it <laughs> yes absolutely and I think as well for me it was um we were probably both grumpy at that time as well because it, it you know it, it was 6 a.m as we yeah. said it was cold and winter and dark um but yes what a lovely start to a story that <laughs> has led us to being uh, working together we we do mm -hmm. actually do work together so um Catherine runs the Phenomenal Woman course, which we'll tell you a little bit about that at the end. Um, and I, I assist her with that. Um, we also have, I think the first time we worked together was probably TEDx, when I did my TEDx yes. talk. It was, it was, it was. So that was 2019. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that was the first time TEDx Northwich had, had put on TEDx. Um, and um, it was, we were working out how best to, to run it and how best to support speakers um, to, to give the TEDx talk of their life. And you were one of the, I think there were eight speakers that year. So you were one of eight that, um, that we worked with and supported. And specifically, um, I was like the speech, speaker coach for those eight people and so yes I got to I mean this is one of the joys of my job by the way is that if you are helping and supporting people express what's really important to them you get to know them quite well 
because you're digging deep to find out what that motivation is. And I can remember with you, I think your talk took a number of different iterations before the final one, which is published on YouTube, by the way, folks, and you absolutely should check out <laughs> Ashley's talk because it is superb. Um, but I think working alongside you as you worked out what it was that you actually wanted to say is, is for me, it's, it's always an honour to do that because this is your talk, it's what's important to you. But it's also a real pleasure to to see that progression and and to stand up. And um, funnily enough, your talk crops up such a lot of times when I have conversations, not not, not necessarily work conversations, but because it was based around education and how how we educate our children um, uh, and how we're doing it badly and how we should be doing it better. It crops up in conversation a lot with other parents when I've looked at my own children's education. In fact, this morning at a networking meeting, I was talking about you oh. um, uh, and education because we were people were with it. I think particularly because exam results were out today, people were talking about was the education system really serving our children? Um, uh, and um, uh, I did, in fact, say you ought to watch this. TED in fact, how's this? I went, I think you ought to watch two TED Talks. One is by Sir Ken Robinson. It's the most highly watched TED Talk in the world. Um, and you should have a look at Ashley Costello's as well. So there you go. In the same breath. Same sentence. That's, mm. That is an honour. That is an honour for <laughs> sure. Um, so, yeah, the TEDx Talk. And, and I'll put the link to the TEDx Talk mm. And I'll also put Catherine's, because Catherine has done a TEDx talk as well, mm. which is really a, kind of about stand, taking the opportunity to stand up into that spotlight and doing it with confidence and, and things like that. And mm. she has a, an amazing story on there that's really heartwarming. But, but actually, it was your TEDx talk that made me put myself forward, mm. along with the lovely Sam Newey, obviously, who, you know, strong arms you into things as well yes, like she does but with such a nice smile on her face yes yeah that you'd never say no um but yeah and I think when you are passionate about something like education like kids like you know standing up and giving people that opportunity to shine things like that TEDx is a really good platform to do it because a is global but b it really makes you hone in on what is important to you when you've only got 10 minutes to talk about something anything in the world what are you going to talk about and I think mm. yours and my TEDx talk is a real testament to that that we're both quite passionate about what we do and mm. for me it changed it completely the TEDx talk changed my business really made me hone in on on the kids side of it and the teen side of it and things um and you know, there was a not a throwaway comment, but there was a sentence in that talk that talks about resilience. And obviously, that's where the resilient kid was born. Mm -hmm. um, but actually going on the program for TEDx um, Northwich, which not all not all TEDx's are the same, guys, mm -hmm. but going on that program and, and learning to craft that with mm -hmm. yourself and the team was really instrumental, I think, in getting that message out there and obviously led us to the book which yes. you know was really amazing like to like you say if you'd have thought at 6 a.m we'd have become friends and colleagues and things like that you'd have gone what but yeah. actually getting up and doing that TEDx would I think it'd take me where I am today absolutely not but I think that's also an example isn't it of of the clearer we are on where we're heading or what's important to us or what we would like to achieve or what we or even just what we would like to see in the world the clearer we are on that then the more likely it is to happen because the, that clarity tends to cut through lots and lots of barriers it's it's when we don't know exactly what we want isn't it or when we um uh, we haven't got a clear path or we don't even know what sort of outcome we'd like to see then it's much more difficult but i think with you particularly um, I think because the, the TED Talk, for example, did fundamentally change what you do and how you do it and, and why you do it, that opportunity to really get clarity about that. And I think you've probably done it in three or four different ways. I mean, I mean you did it and the outcome was a TEDx talk. That was amazing. You've, you've done it because and that's how you've built your business around it, which has been fascinating to watch from the outside. 
But then, of course, you've had to get that clarity again to be able to express it in a book to help other people. And I know when we had the book launch, one of the questions I asked you, and I can't remember whether this was in public or whether it was just before, actually, <laughs> was sort of why, why a book? Why do a book? You've, you've, you've got your TEDx talk. You've got the work that you do with your clients. So what was it that led, led to the book? And I think you were really clear about why you wanted to do that. And because when you're clear, it happens. But I, but I guess, why did you do the book? <laughs> Um, yeah, and I think that's a really interesting question. And I think it's um, that that word clarity is so important, not just in business, but also as a parent. I think when we understand what we want or what changes we want to make, then that becomes easier to do. So I think clarity is a really good word. But to answer your question, um, I think it was a number of reasons. One was because there is only one of me and I love the work that I do when I'm, you know, working with clients, no matter their age, you know, whether they're five year old or a 15 year old or a 21 year old at university or even an adult, you know, to a certain extent. It's for me, it's around there is only one of me. And as much as I love this work, I can't I can't be everywhere and so and also not everybody has got the luxury to be able to afford you know a one-to-one therapist Mm. and sometimes we don't you know for me I don't think we always need therapy sometimes we just need a friend uh, or somebody who can hold your hand through this parenting journey and and that's kind of my hope with the book is that it kind of helps those parents in times when we're struggling or times that we think, I'm just not sure, we've tried this and we've tried that and that's not worked or this not worked mm. or it worked for a little while. Um, so just give that holding hand for parents really at a price that is affordable, um, you know, more than say one-to-one therapy is. So I think, mm. and and to put all your, to put all your thoughts and all your work and stuff in a book is daunting to say the least, but mm. I am so so glad such a reward um with the reactions I've had and the response yeah. to it. so I'm so glad I did it in the end yeah yeah and I and I think it 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 is a use it a, a useful resource really and it's interesting isn't it because I think your book has got a real mixture of sort of how to's within there and then case studies to see how it's worked but actually it's got such a lovely tone um and I remember um, uh, when you asked me to do it and I said, oh, you'll have to give me the book. I'll have to read it. Uh, I love reading. But oh, my God, the pressure to read this book was like, oh, I've got to read it. I've got to understand it. I've got to ask questions on it. And it was uh, so I really did read it. Um, I didn't skim read your book at all. I had loads of post-it notes. It was really exciting. You did. I remember you turning up with all the <laughs> post-it notes sticking out. So I thought, well, at least she's done her homework. <laughs> I have done it. I'm a good girl. I've always been a good girl done my homework. <laughs> But I can remember one of the early things. I can't remember which chapter it is. Forgive me. Um, but I was reading it and it, it it was the bit that said we only have to be able to to be to do this for 30 percent of the time. Mm. You yeah. said it better than that, but but it was that principle. And I can actually remember the moment when I was reading that. So bear in mind, I'm making notes and I've got my post-it notes and I read this and I actually went, oh. Uh, sorry that wasn't if you're listening to this that was just sort of deep sigh of relief um and I thought oh my god and sometimes that's just what parents need to hear um to be able to carry on in our slightly imperfect but loving way um and know that it it'll probably work out okay and I think that mixture of how to's and that reassurance is 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 massive and I know at the book launch, we talked about that 30 percent, didn't we? And I don't know. I don't know whether you noticed, actually, but I noticed in the room even people just went, oh, thank God for that. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's it's something that it doesn't matter if I'm having, you know, a general conversation, um, if I'm talking to a parent that I'm working with, if I'm doing a, a workshop, it does not matter. You know, for me, if you 
do not take away anything else. Remember that we only have to get, research says, we only have to get this parenting malarkey right 30% of the time and they will still turn out okay. And I think, wow, you know, that is something that we should get almost like a, a card when the baby's born with that stamped on and you put it on your fridge. Because I think knowing that we don't have to be perfect is and we don't so we don't have to give ourselves a hard time all, all the time about when we get it wrong because we will get it wrong like I think people think oh you know I don't want to get it right I've got to be perfect no we don't have to be perfect at all we will we will get it wrong you know um and I think that's really important to acknowledge I have had over 25 years experience doing my job I love it I have two kids of my own that will wind me up or push my buttons something manic because they're mine you know and and I have parents going oh, God, how do you stay so calm how do you do this how do you do that you know and actually no I don't always do it right and and that's okay we're human I don't want my kids to think that we have to be perfect anyway but you know those times that we might you know snap at them those times that we've not got it right telling them what we've done wrong only not taking responsibility apologizing if we've got something to apologize for is giving them a really good model for you know making up with friends you know if they fell out with friends or if they've done something wrong if they're making up with us you know we're, we're modeling that behavior but I think that golden 30 percent for me is just amazing because it just means we don't have to give ourselves a hard time yeah, yeah, it lifts some of the pressure, doesn't it? And I think the other thing that's that struck me very much from from the book was it, it takes a whole child. Uh, it takes a whole child to raise a village, dear lord. It takes a whole <laughs> village to raise a child. That's that's something completely different, isn't it? Um, it takes a whole village to to raise a child. And I can remember asking you to to tell the story. I think it's very early on in the book, isn't it? Or it might even be the introduction to the mm. book about you and your nan and you know um uh, if you've done something wrong then your nan will probably find out even before you got home type thing and I, I I I I love that and I know I asked you questions about that because um it's great if you've got a family or a village or a community that that does that but but clearly modern life doesn't always lend itself to that does it and I think you had a really interesting sort of response to that about how you can how, how you can create that village for your child and presumably for yourself as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, just to kind of give you an insight into to what Catherine is saying, and if you haven't got the book already. So I, I was brought up in a village where we had extended family that all lived within, you know, a five mile radius of each other. Um, my nan and granddad were very prominent in the village, you know, um, for various different reasons and they were you know they had lots of friends they'd lived there a long long time and so had my mom and so had you know her and uh, my aunties and uncles and cousins and things so if I did something wrong um then my nan would have had a report before I could run home somebody would have told her you know but equally that also works if I fell over there'd be voices above my head saying oh she's Margaret's kid you know she's Margaret's grandchild they might not know my name I might not know theirs but they knew who I was and who I belonged to and there was that care there was that let's sort this out as a as a village as a community and so I think we don't have that now you know mm -hmm. I'm guilty I lived abroad for quite a number of years when my children were small my mum and dad weren't there you know they came for one month a year that was amazing we came home but they didn't grow up in the village that you know that they were kind of born into really mm. um, and so I think it's really important because it is a component of resilience you know that mm. community around the child wrapping that child 360 with the people that care about them is a component of resilience and quite often I will see students who haven't, you know, whether they've moved away to university or they've moved away from the family home and they haven't got that community around them. And it is about, um, you know, building it for ourselves, for them. And so things like, um, 
for instance, getting them involved in the community aspect. So we were talking about TEDx. My kids both volunteered, as did yours. You know, yes, for TEDx and the speakers were chatting to them and, you know, which was just amazing. And, you know, they, they were interacting with people that they didn't know, but actually they are then you know, they then know those people, or become to know those people, um, and that they have an interest in them. So, for instance, one of our speakers this year, um, Afia, has made an arrangement to have a coffee with my daughter because she wants oh, to go. Wow. To so, yeah. it's, it's things like that that we do. Um, things like your friends. Okay, your friends might not have children the same age. They might, and that's fantastic if they do. Yeah. But actually introducing you know rather than your friends come round and the kids just go upstairs and go on the you know consoles or whatever but having those conversations around what are you up to what are you interested in things like that and um, we've got family friends who live in Suffolk and um, they have got children nearly the same age um, but actually I know that if my kids wanted to chat to them if something was going on that they didn't want to talk to me about they would absolutely feel comfortable enough to do that because we have family get-togethers where you know two or three times a year um we all sit around the table eating and we have those conversations you know get involved in community projects family friends things like that is really important for building our village around our kids yeah 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 so important. I, I, well, it's important for adults as well, isn't it? But you can definitely see it um, uh, working with, with children. We used to, have, when I grew up, I had lots of aunties in inverted commas. You know, everyone was a, an Auntie Pat or an Auntie Eileen yes. or uh, an Auntie Christine. Uh, not blood, blood relatives, but people who would look out for you um, uh, and that you could go to as well. And that, that you think of as you've well, still do, actually. I've still got my Auntie Christine and my Auntie Pat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what? That's so right. So when we moved back from Abu Dhabi and we chose to live here because we hadn't lived locally, you know, we hadn't lived in Hartford or, or Northwich before, um, the the whole, and it kind of full circle now, one of the reasons I was at that fitness club early that morning meeting you was because I knew nobody and I mm. knew I had to involve myself in the community if us as a family were going to settle here yeah. and so I did that so I met lots of friends you Sam Newey you know Joe mm. Karen all them met lots of friends there I also involved myself in the PTA you know and I think sometimes sorry that's an airplane just going past my window a low flying biplane so it might be passing mine shortly. <laughs> Probably it's on its way to you now. I've yeah. got the window open because it's so warm. Um, yeah, and, and actually, I think PTAs are a really good example of doing that because I think we think of them and, oh, my God, you've got to give loads of hours and stuff, and you really don't. Like, we used to have five members of our PTA who would just wrap presents for an hour every Christmas, but they would still come out socially. And that's absolutely fine, you know. So it meant I was involved in this school life of the kids. It meant that I knew friends. So they, that you know, then there was play dates and, and things like that. So the kids then become involved. Now they're both involved in rugby, which is just around the corner. It's things like that that really build a community and, and help kids build the resilience in turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, really important and um I know it's a it's a key theme throughout throughout the book, isn't it? About these mm. different um, things that we can intentionally do, I guess, isn't it? To yeah. support our children. And it's plugging those gaps. You know, if you have a look at, you know, is your child confident? Have they got a community around them? What's their, you know, what are your boundaries like? What is your, what are your kids' empathy like? So I don't know about you, but my eldest, um, if, if she sees, um, you know, one of these adverts on TV where they might need water aid in Africa, like she would be filling up. But if her brother falls down the stairs, that's hilarious. Do you know what I mean? So, so there is there is those um, where we try and build in and and plug those gaps because those gaps in resilience are direct connection to mental health issues. Mm -hmm. The less resilience you've got 
as a person, doesn't matter your age, it could be yours, could be the kids. Actually, there's a direct connection to mental health issues. The less mm. resilience, the higher chance you have having mm. struggling with your mental health. I'll tell you what I'm interested in since we did the book launch is more and more people must have got the book now. Mm. You, um, I mean, even in that room, I saw people going away with new copies of the book, freshly signed by you with a nice new pen or whatever. <clears throat> so more and more people have read the book. And I'm just really interested to know what sort of feedback are people giving to you? In the, I'm sure they will say it's a, it's a good book because it is. But in terms of feedback and how they've been able to use it or the difference that it's made, have you started to get feedback trickling through now? Yeah, so um, I sent out a few advanced copies of the book um, to get feedback, to, you know, for for those that, so that I could say, you know, people have read it, this is what it is, you know, things like that. And that was really positive, which was really lovely. Um, I then got kind of, you know, Amazon reviews and reviews at bookshops and stuff, which was really lovely. But the ones I like the best is local kind of local people or people who have maybe followed me for a while or something like that. And I'll get these voice notes on uh, Messenger and they'll say, Ashley, I picked up the Bible today, meaning my book, which is such a, you know, it's yeah. just so lovely. Like the parents about, I picked it up and you know what? I was really struggling and I reread that and it was just brilliant. Um, and one of the big things is um, there's a lovely lady and she was on the podcast actually last week and her name is Amy and she's got two boys and she is prolific at giving me feedback on, on the book and I love it. And she'll go, oh, I'm just, I'm sorry, I don't want to mind you again, but I just thought I'd tell you this. And she will actively use stuff in the in the book with her boys and then report back and so I think that for me if nobody else did it just Amy's <laughs> voice messages are enough but to be honest I think I have had such a warm reception and and lots of voice messages like that I mean I'm singling Amy out because she was on the podcast and um, but just things like I knew some of this stuff already, but I hadn't realised how I was um, how I was using it before. Or sometimes it's a it's a case of tweaking the language that they use with the children. Mm. Or it might be a case study. So a lot all my case studies are kids that I've worked with or parents that I've worked with, and they'll go, oh, "I read that," and I just thought, "Oh, thank God, it's not just me." Mm -hmm. You know. So it's that kind of stuff. But I guess one of the biggest things that's been in, in almost all the feedback is actually it's practical, but actually there's a sprinkling of this mank humour that you have <laughs> through it. And actually it's just, it feels like a companion. And I talk very much about the beginning about how we're here to walk our kids home. Yeah. And I hope that that's what the book does for parents really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I can certainly testament that because I, I read it myself. And actually, I don't know if I ever told you this. I might have done. Oh, I'm I know. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, yes. So I got the book. And and really, my purpose in reading the book was possibly quite different to other people's purpose. Yes. You know, it had a very definite. Um, I was going to, you know, ask you a number of questions um, on at a book launch. Um, so I opened, I, so I got the book and I thought, well, do you know what? My kids are 24 and 14. So actually, I just wonder, was my question mark, how relevant this, this was to me? Because effectively, I've got someone who's at the teenage stage, um, and he's still delightful, by the way. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and I've got someone who's, you know, who's, who's to all intents and purposes, is a grown man and, and doesn't live at home. On the, on the other scale, I've got this sort of 10 year gap in between them. And I thought, so this will be interesting. <laughs> How pompous and snobbish can you get, quite <laughs> frankly? So I'm <laughs> reading the book and almost from the get go thinking, oh, my goodness, um, it, it doesn't actually matter how old your child is. You are still a parent. And I think the thing that struck me was that you you still influence your children however old they are in fact part of me is thinking well you know my mum could read this and, I, and I'm her child you know 
Um, I'll just tell her about the 30% and then she'll be fine. Um, <laughs> but but I, I didn't think it would, I thought it might be more about smaller children. And it clearly is. I mean, there's lots of lots of really helpful stuff around that. But what struck me was it was applicable to parenting of children of all sorts of different ages, because it isn't uh, it, it, it's to do with um, how you interact and it's to do with what you build around your child. And it's to do with relationships. It's not for two year olds or mm. you know, six year olds or whatever. So I, found, I I got so much more out of that book than I was expecting. But if you understand the context of that, because um, I was reading it with a very specific purpose. But, yeah, I, I totally get it. it. The Bible. I even took it to Peru. I'm looking around now because somewhere it's in my pile of stuff from Peru. But I took it to Peru with me. How about yes, that? you did. And I even got I got a lovely picture of a mutual friend of ours, Janet, who actually has worked in schools for years and years and years on the plane reading it and it was just amazing yeah. um I think there's two things there that you've said actually uh Catherine and I think for me one is that um I've had quite a few grandparents come to me go in oh my god they've bought it with a view of giving it probably the daughter-in-law or something yeah. you know with them yeah. do this. Um, and they've read it and actually um and you'll know one of them, Sandra, who is, you know, um, she's posts on Instagram a lot and she's she's a mother of five, grandmother to, you know, lots. And she just said, oh, my goodness, I just wasn't expecting that as my kids are grown, that it would have any kind of influence or any relevance. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I've had quite a few grandparents say that, which is just lovely, you know, and I, again, as parents, for me, it's not around what you know. It's about wanting to know more, wanting mm -hmm. to learn for our kids because mm -hmm. it's a parenting journey. I know that sounds like a cliche, but, you know, I say to my eldest who is 16 next week and I oh say, well, you know, and I say to her, I've never parented a 15 year old before. Mm -hmm. This is this is something that we have to work out and learn together and, and giving her that you know, sense of control, but a negotiation, I don't mean around bedtimes or anything, but you know, that sense that we're in this together is, mm -hmm. is a really lovely thing. So I think grandparents have got a huge influence on me. I think um, we don't live in our extended families anymore, which is such a shame, which is why I think our resilience is not as high as it used to be, mm -hmm. um, because we don't have those role models for good or for bad. Mm -hmm. um, so I think grandparents are amazing. And the other thing is, I think a lot of people initially thought that's what the book was going to be is for the younger. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the reason I call it The Resilient Kid and the reason my business is called The Resilient Kid is actually as a nod to my Mancunian roots, really. <laughs> and that's why. Uh, because in our family, we would say our kid, meaning yeah. anyone who's related to you, really. Because yeah. we do have a lot of aunties and uncles that are not blood relatives. Um, you know, you would say our pat, our yeah. meaning they are. Well, you were doing Yorkshire, so I'm not the Mancunian, I'm the Yorkshire lass. Um, but my mum calls her called her brother um, our kid. It was yeah. our kid in Australia, and that's because he was the only brother. Um, yeah. So it had a, another a slightly, but yeah, our kid. It's great. I don't think I realize I realize that, but I do. I I I do get that it's for sure, and I certainly found loads in there for my older children. But I think also, especially for the twenty-four-year-old, mm -hmm. um, because it's easy. I think, especially when they're not in the house, to think, oh, they they're grown up and they're living their life, um, you know. And it, at his age, I was married, and you know, there's there's those sorts of things floating around in your head. But at the end of the day, they're they're still your your children um uh and and actually aren't still full grown I mean I think I learned that through the book as well and through conversations with you there's still a lot of learning to go and and, and do so yeah I, it's it's definitely not just for for small children yeah and I think I think it's interesting I mean uh, Catherine you know I know both your boys and they're they're absolute fine specimens of young men um but you're right there in the fact that 
particularly if you think about your 24 year old, his brain is not fully developed yet. Mm -hmm. You know, and I talk about that in the book because we don't talk every day language around our brain and how that affects our behavior and, and, and kids behavior and things like that. So there's, you know, there's lots of, lots of tips and, and strategies in there around how you can be more aware of why they're behaving like that. So, so one of my kind of key phrases really with parents is, you know, they're behaving like that, whatever that behavior is to fulfill a need. And um, so we need to work out what that need is so we can plug it. So we can, we can provide it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I think that's a big thing, but also around our brains, if we look at the, the part that regulates our emotions for us, you know, so stops us flipping our lid and going crazy or road rage and all that. But the part that keeps us calm, the part that processes difficult emotions and our brain is set up to do hard things. It's wired for hard things, but we often shy away from it. And as parents, we often turn our kids away from hard things. And actually they need to, to practice for later in life when we're not here. But if we look at the brain specifically, neuroscience tells us that the brains are not fully developed in boys until they're around 27, 28. (laughs) And so you've still got a few years left to go with the eldest. Thank Um, you very much. (laughs) Yeah, with girls, it is is sooner, you know, it's early 20s. Um, But it is that specifically that part of the brain that helps them regulate their own emotions and manage their own emotions. And so, you know, I say one of our big jobs as a parent is to help kids, whatever their age, regulate their emotions. And I remember, you know, my mom going back to my granddads and saying stuff like, oh, this has happened. What do we do? And they all sit around with a cup of tea and talk about it. And that is walking our kids through that process. Mm -hmm. walking them home and we're never ever too old you know to do that um now I'm sure there's things that you talk to your mum about I certainly know my younger sister comes to me you know and she's she's way past the 20 odd uh phase you know and and that's what you do is you you know you talk it through you walk through that process with them yeah yeah I suppose I have to ask this question well this is great actually being able to ask questions instead of answering them um is there another book so um, as Catherine knows, she's she's kind of smiling here because she knows the answer to this. Because when we was at the book launch, um, Catherine did an amazing job of um, what we call a head to head where we do like a Q&A and stuff. And um, to, a, you know, a very busy room of of people that had been invited to the book launch. And so right at the end, after these amazing questions that she'd asked and we'd had a laugh and there was a, a few tears and and different things like that. Um, you said uh, I had one last question, one last question. And there was this little hand that goes up at the back and it was my hubby, Dave. And he said, this is from a purely selfish point of view because <laughs> I go away to write the book. I don't write the book here because you just do, you, you don't have the same headspace when you've got kids and washing and, and work and everything. So I do go away with um, a couple of friends and we, and we write for the whole weekend. And this little hand goes up and he goes, you know, purely selfish reasons. Is there another book in the making? <laughs> and before that question was asked, I would have said no. I would have said no because it's hard. It's a hard slug to write a book. And it's not my natural forte. I prefer to talk. I prefer to present. I prefer to deliver verbally than write. Mm. And so it's not my natural method. And so I would have said, absolutely not. Don't be ridiculous, blah, blah, blah. And that night he asked a question. And before, without a heartbeat, I just went, yeah, there is. And it will be the resilient team next. Yeah. Um, and that is because I think, yes, you're right, Catherine, this book is, is you know, for any parent. It's not specifically age related. But I think teens get a very, they get a hard time in the press. They get a hard time sometimes in the community. And they are delightful. I work with them every day. Um, they are challenging but there is nobody better placed to give you a realistic view of the world than than to chat to a teen. Um, and they have their very, you know, a very unique set of problems where they're 
and issues because their brain is developing at such a fast rate of knocks, puberty hits, all that kind of stuff. And I think we now have social media and various different things that influence them, that impact their lives. And also they're in, you know, we started the conversation with education, but their education system is not geared up to get the best out of them. Mm. And so I think they are struggling. And I think it's really important for me to be able to take my experience and and put it out there for parents of teens. uh, And just really so that they have, you know, something they can fall back on when days are dark. Because sometimes they are, and sometimes they're amazing with the team. Sometimes yeah. you have a difficult ride for a little while and, and yeah. it's important that somebody's got their back and I'm hoping that that's what the next book will do, really. And can I can I help launch it with you? Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> oh, absolutely. excellent. Uh, <laughs> that's not just because I want a free book, by the way. I'll pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I, yeah, she's quite, she's she was quite cheap for me, a, a free book and a glass of Prosecco. Um, oh, such a cheap date. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, what I, I think... For me, what I would really love um, to do is, and I'm just, I'm just in conversation now with um, a mutual friend of ours, Paula, um, who is a business coach, and the the kind of model that I use, I want to train up other people to coach teens because I think that's really important um, to to just help them. But actually, my ultimate is to have teen coaches where we have peers coaching each other, um, you know, that have been maybe been through tough times, but actually can turn around to, you know, peers or people that are a little bit younger than themselves, have having us learn a skill set um, mm-hmm. and, and help each other because they are such a challenging but amazing part of our community that are really underrated. Yeah. Oh, that sounds exciting. I've not heard that before. So I'm already, my brain's buzzing now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, um, that's, that, um, well, yeah, that conversation happened this morning. So yes, absolutely. That's new. Hey. Awesome. <laughs> Lovely. So yeah, um, Catherine, Thank you so much for today. It has been lovely to chat about the book from somebody who has a read it. (laughs) He is a parent of, you know, a wider stretch as well of of age groups with your boys. And and that's just that's brilliant because you you kind of have an insight then into, um, you know, in a different insight to me. Um, So, yeah. Um, Before we finish. I'm going to put all your links and stuff in the in the show notes. Thank you. But um, and this is pure pure indulgence because I love oh. this bit. Um, tell us a little bit about the phenomenal woman workshop that we um, that I'm so lucky to come and uh, assist you with because I just think it's such a cracking course and we just vibe for two days I think on that. Yeah. I, I love it so just tell tell the listeners if you know and this is it is specifically aimed aimed at women but it's I think it's aimed at lots of women that would probably be listening to this podcast who you know who are parents but actually also have another life because you know you and I are parents but we are also business women and yeah. and you know we do lots of work in the corporate world as well so tell us a little bit about the phenomenal woman course oh well it it is something um that is a highlight of my calendar as well um uh, and it, it's it's coming up very soon actually where you and I will be working together on it it's a two-day workshop it only runs twice a year um uh, and it is it's aimed at those women who I've got something to say. Um, now that could be, and, and you'll know from people who've been on it before, sometimes that's people who have their own businesses like you and me, and, and we've got something to say. Um, it could be our business, our product, or it could be our beliefs in something. We sometimes have women who come who are on a mission, 
um, uh, and they want to set up a movement. They want to express themselves and, 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 and gather people around them. And sometimes people come because they know that standing up and speaking in public um, requires a certain skill set and they want to learn that skill set. But alongside that, they want a load of confidence. So they want to look, sound and feel confident when they're doing it. So we get a wide range of, of women, but we only take a small group at a, at a time. And I think that's why it's such... Um, a lovely experience both for you and me but also for the people who come on it because um, it's a safe space where women can come they get to do rather than just to intellectually process Mm -hmm. Um, so they learn some stuff for sure but they have they they do it and they practice it and they get feedback and that feedback is very nurturing it's very directive and um, um, and it supports them to, to be better for the next iteration. So it's really practical. And we know that people feel very um, empowered at, at the end of that. And I think, you know, looking back at how that program has evolved, because I started running it about 10 years ago, then there was a bit of a gap. And then we started again after COVID. And one of the things I recognised was that that support and insight for people on their individual uh, speaking journey for want of a better phrase needed this high quality of feedback and insight and I knew I needed some support with that on the workshop so that everyone got you know enough of it but with 10 people on the course I couldn't do that for 10 and I was thinking right who do I know who do I know who has an insight into human nature who do I know who is excellent at being able to shift sometimes how we see things and can give feedback in a way that's direct but supportive and I thought oh who who could that person be and it was you Um, and I can remember approaching you and saying "Would, would you be interested in doing this and I think what I need you for is when we do an exercise, would you do the feed? Would you do take half the group and give them feedback and I'll take the other half? Um, and after the first workshop where we did that really successfully, I thought you you gave so much more than that. Um, and I think in, in part, it's nothing really to do with the resilient kid, but actually it's everything to do with the stuff that you talk about having been supported and surrounded by your tribe it's about looking what the gaps are and finding ways of building those gaps it's the insight that you have in human nature and I think because we have a similar approach different skill sets but a similar approach I think and I'm sure you would agree actually I know we've talked about it before we work really well together and the output for that means that those women that go on that program they come away with a set of skills that they can use time and time and time again Um, and just get better and better at the more they use them Um, but they also come back being nurtured being supported uh, being empowered and they're big big words aren't they Um, but feeling more confident that every single time 10 women will leave the room two inches standing two inches or two feet taller you know just holding themselves differently and and thinking about themselves differently and that's very very exciting and all that that means is this world gets to hear stuff that it needs to hear and changes happen that need to happen which is you know exciting yeah and it's funny because I was as as you was talking I was thinking and you were talking about the women on there and I was thinking about the different people that have come through and actually we've had you know everyone from kind of an accountant Mm -hmm. who is you know talking in front of a board to other people who who are giving presentations to others who have gone on to do TEDx talks which um, has happened this year um to people who are standing on big stages and delivering you know huge stuff so it's like anything from and I think we always say that it's anything from kind of you know doing a live on Insta to standing on a stage it really doesn't matter but it's about that confidence in and clarity in that message and being able to deliver it without you know all the nerves all the the worry and am I I doing this right yeah 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 how how do I do this and then how do I do it to the very best of my ability and I think we we encourage people to say and it's not just doing it to the best of your ability it's about allowing you to come across you know, your personality, your your beliefs, being absolutely you when you stand up and being really proud of that um, uh, and proud of what you're saying and proud of the way that you're saying it. 
because you know that you know how to say it in a way that will make a difference for people listening yeah absolutely and I think probably to just come back full circle we have um the lovely Sue France who is here locally with us who helps and and we are for those two days that village you know those those oh. speakers that come those women that come on to the course they they come very nervous you know quite often um not sure fully what to expect they know they're gonna you know get an outcome mm. but actually as as that small group and us three become that village for that person and and their tribe for the for those two days and they do absolutely walk out taller than when they walked in with you know a bag of tools of course but with the confidence to share their message with the world which I just really really love yeah and it's interesting you just mentioned Sue there because from a personal point of view I tend to work on my own a lot of the time I do one-to-one coaching or I run programs and I do that on my own um, but actually for Phenomenal Woman, I feel like I have my tribe as well. And that is, that I think makes me a better trainer. It makes me better at what I do um, uh, because um, Sue is just so wonderful um, and she looks after our physical needs, you know, where we are and what we eat and what we drink. And she just makes us feel, all of us and, and myself feel so special and looked after um and then you know i did i do the delivery and you support with the with the feedback and the insights and things like that so we really all gel and that becomes then my tribe um mm. as well which is i i really appreciate and i know i've told you and i've told sue that before as well yeah it really is a highlight of the calendar mm -hmm. um so thank you very much, Catherine. We will drop, um, if you are interested in, you know, um, getting some coaching for whether it's presentations or you want to improve on your speaker st skills, things like that, or you want to hire Catherine, she will be a little bit more expensive than a book and a bottle of Prosecco. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you if you like the sound of Catherine doing the head to head, then get in touch with her. We'll drop her links um, in the show notes, along with her TEDx talk and also um, the details of the phenomenal woman. They're out, aren't they, Catherine? The, the they are. Time. Yeah, they are absolutely out. Yeah. Um, so we'll drop them in the show notes. Thank you very much for listening. Catherine, thank you for not being my guest today, but being my host. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Take care.